to introduce Johannes von Trapp, our gracious host. He's had a long history with uh, as a tree farmer, 2006 Tree Farmer of the Year, a forestry graduate, master's in forestry from Yale, been enrolled in the current use program for 25 years, maybe 30 years, um, long advocate for practicing sustainable forestry throughout the region and on the property. Johannes, thanks for having us here. We really appreciate it and love to have you come up and say a few words of welcome. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with you. And uh, uh, it's kind of, I feel honored that, that this organization is here. Uh, We've tried to take care of our land, and we've tried to acquire more land, and we've, we've done a lot of things that uh, we had to do to be able to uh, take care of the land. So I find myself with a flourishing resort, but I still don't think of it that way. I still think of it as a Vermont hill farm with a, a lot of timberland. And uh, that bothers my kids some. They're now, they're now saying, hey, we can do this, we can do that. And I said, well, that, that's sort of not in my vision. But those sorts of conflicts, I guess, are inevitable in any family business. We moved, we bought the property, the first property here in 1942. Uh, my family came uh, from Austria in uh, uh, 38. Uh, my mother was pregnant with me. I was born in Philadelphia in 1939. And, uh, and I was three years old when we moved up here. So, uh, in answer to Terry Gulick's question about have you lived all your life in Vermont? Not yet. <laughs> Uh, we started with the one farm here, uh, and uh, the next year the neighboring property came on the market, and uh, we added that, so we had, we had 600 acres. Uh, and my parents really thought that they would uh, run this as a farm and, and make a living on it as a farm. Um, because the scenery reminded them a lot of Austria, they assumed the climate was going to be the same way. <laughs> uh, big mistake. Uh, it's a lot colder, a lot shorter growing season, and uh, the soils are not quite as fertile. Uh, so, at that time, the ski industry was starting up. We were away most of the winter, singing, traveling, and uh, so we rented out our rooms to skiers, and that's how we backed into the hotel business. Um, one thing led to another, and now we have uh, 100 guest rooms and uh, a bunch of villas and guest houses, and on a busy day, with all the units filled, we'll have close to 1,000 guests on property. Um, so, uh, that has enabled us to continue to manage the timberland and the farmland and try to keep this uh, uh, a lovely property. This happens to be the only weekend that this summer that we didn't book a wedding for this uh, tent. <laughs> because we knew it was going to be too busy to deal with the group on this day. Well, then Alan said, hey, we'd like to hold a meeting up there. So um, I said, I think we can manage that. <laughs> I've, I've watched a lot of changes in Vermont. Um, and 
probably because I'm getting to be an old guy. Uh, I'm, I'm not happy with some of them. But on the whole, it's a much better place to live for most Vermonters than it was in the 50s and 60s. Um, and I can remember when people were really, really uh, living a hard scrabble life in this state. And that's much less often now, much less common, I, I believe. Uh, the, uh, the key thing is to maintain the quality of the state, I think. Um, not to become another commodity, but to differentiate ourselves for either for tourism or for our agricultural products. It's a little more difficult with timber products. But uh, if, we, uh, if we continue to build the quality of the brand of Vermont, uh, I, I think it will be in all our best interests. So if, if anyone has a question about, uh -oh. I just got a cell phone the other day. So <laughs> my family beat me into it. I don't know how to turn it off. Um, if, if anyone has a question, uh, either about the land management or uh, the business or uh, brewery, <laughs> the, the brewery was based, and I, I understand that Alan said the reason our beer is so good. <laughs> a friend of mine shot his. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's why he's running the forest here. <laughs> But if, if there were any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. I have a question. Yes. What do your guests say about the forest, and has that changed over the years? That's a very good question. Um, okay. The, uh, what, the question is, what, uh, what do our guests say about the forest here? Um, i got to tell you a story. Uh, in the early 70s, we were starting the cross-country ski program. And I spent a lot of time in the ski touring center talking to people, trying to convince them to try this. Um, and one lady was saying to me, well, I'd do it, but I'm afraid of bears. And I said, ma'am, you don't have to be afraid of bears. Um, in the fall, when the snow flies, bears find a cozy place and they curl up and they sleep all winter. And when the snow's gone in the spring, they come out again. But, you know, this is January. You don't have to worry about that. She looked at me and she said, Young man, this was a long time ago. <laughs> Young man, I may be from New York, but there's no way you're going to convince me of a story like that. <laughs> Um, we have a huge cross-section of the public among our guests. Some people are very sophisticated, well-traveled. Um, others are just up from the city for a day and don't really know what to look for or to enjoy. And uh, uh, so in, in answer to Alan's question, I, I would say that uh, our guests love the views, and the forest, of course, is a major part of the view, um, especially at this time. Um, they don't, in general, understand what they're walking through when they walk out on our trails. Um, but they know when they come back that they've had a very pleasurable, restorative experience. And I, I think
think that's what it's all about, really. Um, the forest provides an environment that allows us to create an experience that sends people back to their everyday jobs, restore and uh, inspired to uh, continue with the struggles of life. Uh, and we, we try to keep that in mind when dealing with difficult customers. Um, I, I know you, 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 you probably think we don't have any difficult customers. <laughs> The problem is they can get on the internet now and write about it. <laughs> so you really have to treat them very carefully. <laughs> yes? I, I was wondering if the increase in the ticks have created problems with visitors. And uh, the increase in ticks hasn't hit us as badly right here as some parts of Vermont, but it has started. Uh, and, uh, and it is a concern. Uh, but the, the public doesn't seem to be too worried about it. OK, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's, it's a privilege to host this gathering. And uh, I hope the afternoon goes well. I unfortunately cannot participate, but uh, I think that's what all that phone call was about. <laughs>
Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please say nay. Ayes have it. Thanks, everybody. John Bach, we're done with the end with the business meeting. And I'll let you take over. Uh, we'll introduce John Buck, the, the vice president. He's going to MC the rest, and he probably won't take that long to get on in the next second. I think so. Thanks, John. Good afternoon, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here, and it's really uh, a great pleasure uh, for me to be able to introduce to you the, the, our speakers for the afternoon. And the first person up would be my good friend, Brian Kilburn, who will be just presenting um, information about the Tree Farmer of the Year Award. Is that right, Brian? Well, yeah, with the whole COVID thing, it's really interrupted the calendar, I'm sorry to say, but I think we're all aware of that sort of issue, but if you could come down, please. And Al, all right, would you like to, you, you would like to say something about tree farm too, wouldn't you? Yes. When, when, when we're done here, we'll have yeah. you up next. You Great. Up yeah, we, we, should, we should be up front here, yes, we'll yeah, do that. Sorry, folks. So when the music stops, sit back down in your chair. <laughs> This is one of those moments when you all say, it was working 15 minutes ago. Uh, yeah, and then it was, and then it was, and then it was. I think there's folks on this side of the audience. Oh, bowl. <laughs> <laughs> or just if they can go, yeah, maybe against, go behind all of this in some way. They seem to project really well. I'm, I get the sense you can all hear me really easily. Is that true? Because I'm not really standing on this very close to the ball. Okay. You all right? Very good. All right, here's, here's a little change, field change number one. I'm pleased to introduce to you Mr. Al Robertson, who's the chair of the Vermont Tree Farm Program, who is intimately related to the Vermont Woodlands Association. And uh, here you are, Al. Thanks so much. Thanks, John. Actually, past chair of the Tree Farm Program. I'm filling in for Rick Pizzazzaro and Kathy Bland, who couldn't make it today. Uh, the Tree Farm Program is alive and well, and uh, we, it's very clear just by looking at the back here, they're not all old either. <laughs> um, we have some, uh, some uh, tree farms of note here that have achieved uh, 25 and 50 year tree farm status. And I'm not sure uh, any of them have been able to make it, but uh, we have two 50 year tree farms. One is Joanna Maynard, tree farm number 249. Is she here today? And William Emmons III, tree farm number 261. They are going to get special signs and uh, that they can put up and the silver and the gold indicating that status. But uh, we have a lot of those tree farms in waiting that don't have quite those ages yet that will be coming up in future years. We have three 25-year tree farms. Uh, Joseph Weston, tree farm number 1196. Uh, Ken Weston, tree farm number 1317. And I have here no relation to the other Weston. And last but not least, Mr. Arthur Dugas, tree farm number 1322. Now, 
not good anyway i would say please congratulate these people for achieving that status that's a lot of years behind the plate and on doing tree farm work and i would also add we as tree farmers like to have our tree farms open to the public to take a look at what we're doing if any of you tree farmers out there want to show off your tree farms we're always looking for somebody to sponsor a walk in the woods keep that in mind thank you very much uh, can you stay here can you? we had a um a uh, a walk at marsh billings a few weeks ago maybe yes can you just describe what that was about yeah he wasn't there uh, all right that was what the 50 a 50 that was the 50th anniversary of tree farm number one in vermont marsh billings rockefeller yeah that was a pretty big day pretty big scene um 50 years actually they are about 63 years actually 63 about 63 years tree farm number one because it wasn't it was, it was more it was more 63. Yes. It was a big year, 63. Yeah, we had that celebration uh, because they are the first forest of recognized importance. Thank you. Forty. First yes. forest of recognized For importance. The forest of forest of recognized importance is a very, very important term in the forestry movement, indicating a forest that is very, very special, either silviculturally or historically. Ryan, let's do some ramble on. We explained a little bit. So, um, obviously, last year with, with everything going on, we couldn't do the typical uh, Tree Farmer of the Year award, um, which was presented to the Starr family up in Troy, Troy, Vermont, who's been a client of mine for a little bit now. Um, Unfortunately, yeah, because we couldn't do a big gathering where we historically people can come do a tour of the property, have a nice lunch afterwards, and congratulate the family for all their hard work. We did, uh, the Star family is very large, so we had our own party. <laughs> and uh, two or three of us on the committee went up uh, with the Tree Farm Award assigned and had a very nice afternoon. Um, and got to meet people that I didn't know. Um, I believe there's five generations, is that right? So five generations of the Star family up in Troy that <clears throat> are gonna continue on with the legacy. Um, and my involvement first started with Jim Starr. Um, he was one of Isla's sons, and Jim had a very infectious character, always, uh, always excited about the woods and he could, he was always looking for a good time and, and looking for the next project. Um, unfortunately, Jim passed away a couple of years ago, and uh, I thought this would be a great opportunity, one, to try to honor Jim for his land ethic and his drive in the community, but also representing the whole Star family. So this award was a little different. Typically, the awards nominated are given to one landowner. Um, the Starr family has five different parcels, um, two of them owned by Isla in a trust, and two of them owned by the siblings, and another property owned by Jim Starr and his wife, Jennifer. Um, oh, there we go. Okay. How do I set up There you go. So, so this is the, um, their sign that we presented to them last year. It's right up off their property, off the main road. Um, they are right adjacent to Jay Peak, so we get a lot of traffic. And um, another brother, Gary Starr, unfortunately passed away this past year. And they have chosen to do a memorial for both of them using the tree farm sign, which I think is very honorable. And it looks beautiful from the road. 
So unfortunately, they can't be with, here with us today, but um, they're wonderful people. So here's uh, some of the five generations from last year. Um, we had a beautiful sunny day, nice big family. It felt like we had a typical tree farm meeting anyways. So. so it's a little bit hard to see, but this is the makeup of the primary ownership of the Star family, the four parcels. Um, it extends, this chunk extends over 430 acres total. Uh, what's not shown on this map is the 84 acres that Jim and Jennifer own, about a mile or so up the road. And another property <clears throat> that Jim worked on quite closely um, that the village of Troy owns, 116 acres, that he helped get conserved. And what's really cool about that is that property has over a mile of river, river frontage on the Mississippi River. And between that property and the Starr family, there's nearly three miles of river frontage. And um, although the Star family's property is not conserved at this time, it's, it's pretty well protected through them. So it's a really nice attribute. And the ownership's made up, as I said, is about 100 acres of open land. Um, most of it's being farmed by some local agricultural crops, mostly hay. Um, some of the family does also raise beef. And that was a local... <laughs> Local resident, uh, I started doing the inventory for the management plan update this fall, and I was greeted by this fella. And he didn't follow me around the woods, but he certainly knows the area quite well. <laughs> so this was uh, their tree farm sign, again, right on the main road. And back in 2016, we did a timber sale on the property. And part of that sale, a big focus was some wildlife habitat improvement. And this was one of two areas we did some aspen patch cuts. So this is about 20 feet foot tall aspen saplings that have grown back in about five, six years. Uh, so it's pretty impressive. Uh, other things that the sale focused on um, was some improvements to some trail crossings. And we did some uh, timber stand improvement and removed some high risk white pine. Uh, the property also has a cabin on it besides the farm. Um, this cabin, the family gathers at, I think, I don't know about every weekend, but very frequently. And it's kind of their center, central meeting place. And it's a great location. Uh, they also have this nice little cottage or camp um, on the property just for some getaways. And right adjacent to that is a beautiful apple orchard that they keep mowed and keep that a lot of wildlife views. They also have a little sugar house, a little hobby operation, a um, few hundred taps, I believe. And uh, so they, they do a little bit of everything on the property, which is really neat. Uh, this is one of their trails. I haven't finished mapping all their trail network yet, but I'm sure it's probably over four or five miles of trails that they keep open that they use, the general public use, and a lot of these trails will go down and access the river where they have a couple different campsites, again, for family gatherings. And it seems like each sibling and everyone has their own favorite spot along the river and lots of different access points. So this continues to lead, again, the highlight of the property in my mind is really the river frontage. It's Missisco River is a beautiful river, um, historic, a lot of history in Troy. And the uh, Star family's done a tremendous job protecting the river and keeping the forest buffers and, and also keeping access for locals to, to use. So just a couple pictures here moving through. One of their well-maintained campsites, plenty of firewood. An interesting note, and this is uh, probably a, a theme that unfortunately is going to be happening in Vermont more often, as I was doing my inventory one day, I could smell some smoke. And I didn't think much about it, but as I was coming up to one spot right next to the river, there is about a 10 yard by 30 yard patch of uh, a smoldering duff fire that had just been smoldering and smoldering and smoldering for days on end. No idea how to get started. Wasn't near a fire pit. Wasn't really near too much of anything other than a trail, but um, I called up Jack, 
and Jack came strolling down with his uh, UTV and we got some buckets and some water and we distinguished the edges, but it was pretty interesting. I haven't really come across something like that yet. And this was in a, under a hemlock spruce fir forest right next to the river. Not something you'd think would be dry, but the fire had definitely been smoldering for multiple days on end and really exposed the root systems. But so just keep that in mind as things change. But this is a picture of the family, the siblings and Isla. Um, Starting on your left is Jim Starr, then there's Betty, and there's Gary, Jack Starr is to the right of Isla, and then there's Virgil and Billy. So those are the core group of the Starr family and with four, three or four other generations behind them. So that's, uh, we couldn't properly congratulate them last year, so let's all give them a round of hand for this year. event. Rick Bezazaro and I went to the family's home, to their property, to present that beautiful tree farm sign. And we were going to a small family gathering. There were 50 people. <laughs> Just immediate family. That's what we were told. We didn't even invite everybody. So this is a generational tree farm, and it is so wonderful have those, to have those properties in our system because it means that property has been cared for a long time and will continue to be cared for for a long time. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Ryan. Thank you again, Star Family. Thanks for coming down today. Great to have you here. All right, where is Michael? Where are you, Michael? Great. Our next guest is Commissioner Michael Snyder of the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. And he's here on behalf of the state to uh, share joys and concerns as far as the forest, is forest resources concerned uh, from a state perspective. Michael uh, has a professional background in forestry. He served as Chittenden County Forester for a number of years before being called to the State House as the Commissioner of Forest Parks and Recreation. And I think one of the, and he's a wonderful guy, he's been a great leader, and I think one of the uh, most significant attributes to Michael's tenure and leadership is the fact that he's been Commissioner under two different, very different, governors, one Democratic and one Republican. And so I speak, I think that speaks very highly of his ability to see very broadly and to address issues in a very judicious manner. He's also, he lives here in Stowe with his family and he is uh, quite a good deer hunter too, by the way. So I'd like to bring up uh, Michael Snyder. Thanks, John. Uh, I guess the pressure's on for deer season now. Uh, I think Wilcox get, really is the one who gets that. Uh, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm really happy to join you all here uh, for the annual Vermont Woodlands Association meeting. Um, give it up for the Star family. Huh? That's, that's a tremendous story. And thank you, Ryan, for sharing that and your work with them. Um, it's good to hear Johannes. Uh, I do live here in town. I live across Route 100 over in Stowe Hollow. You wouldn't think it by how long it took me to get here today. Uh, but uh, I, I'd like to actually just acknowledge Johannes a little bit further. Um, uh, I moved to Stowe 30 years ago, and he was very kind and very welcoming, and um, we, we kind of connected, and it early on discovered a mutual interest in forestry. 
And I don't know if that was made clear, but you know, Johannes has a background. He'd gone to the Yale School of Forestry. Um, and um, so he, we had a connection there, and uh, it's, it's lasted. And I consider him a good friend, and um, he's been an awesome kind of community member speaking on behalf of forestry, on behalf of EWA Tree Farm. Uh, and that's really valuable. Um, I get a kick out of his story about the, the early cross-country ski. You know, it's, it's probably the premier Nordic center in the world, or at least in North America. Um, and uh, I love to ski, and uh, I took my daughter uh, skiing, and she really got addicted to it, particularly the riding the lifts part and zooming down. Uh, we said, well, you got to learn how to do some Nordic skiing. Of course, we'll take you over to Traps. And uh, I really wanted to tell Johannes, if you, that, that I wish you could have heard this. She said, we did this, and she came, and it was beautiful and all. And she said, when, Dad, when, when are we going to when are we gonna go back to the fun kind of skiing? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I, I'm really happy to join you here. And I, I've been asked to give a little state of the forest kind of thing, and um, uh, which I'm happy to do. Uh, I won't carry on very long. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's, um, I like to think, you look around, uh, at this time of year, we are world famous for our foliage. Uh, to me, it, it, it really ought to be an annual reminder, not so much to BWA members, um, foresters, loggers, people who work in forest industry, but to everyone else, I really wish they would just see it as an annual reminder of how lucky we are not just to live in a beautiful place, but a heavily forested place, um, and that there's reasons for it, the way it looks. And it's largely because of the 80-some thousand landowners that own the majority of Vermont's forest lands. And it, it takes an awful lot more. There are people who work in those woods and related industries, etc. but it's kind of the backbone. And so I'm very pleased to come share with this audience um, on, at this time of year where we really need to you know, kind of wake up as trees come out of the background, because for most people they really are. Take it for granted, this green mass behind us. And once a year we get to say, wow, look at this. Um, I'd ask all of us to push that and say, well, why does it look like this? And take credit for it. Um, I try to do it with all the reporters I get to talk to every year as the leaf chief, uh, giving, you know, sort of the foliage forecasts and observations that's largely crowdsourced from our staff around the state. Um, but every time I get interviewed, and it's a lot, from the CBS Evening News to Morning Edition on NPR to the Stowe Reporter, uh, I always say that part about, well, why does it look this way? We claim it's the world's best foliage. It's a lot of fun to pick on Maine. I say, we'll give it up for their lobster every time, but we're going to claim the, for, the, the foliage. Uh, and we make a push for that and say, well, there's a credible, it's fun, fun rivalry, but there's a credible claim we make. Uh, and it's because of this, the, the working forest, the families that own it, uh, the traditions and the culture of forestry. Uh, and they always put in the part about peak or that I'm not sure what peak is, but they never, no, no journalist has ever included that part. Think about it. I, I say it pretty much every time. And it's just not an interesting story to them. They want to know um, when's peak. So, you know, I think that's something for us all to think about and then maybe help, you know, push it, because it's true. Um, and indeed, we are, I like to say, forest strong. You know, we're Vermont strong. Vermont is forest strong. And what I mean by that is we have an unbelievable number and array of valuable, important benefits that accrue to all people um, from our forest lands. They just give us so much. Uh, again, a lot of it's um, overlooked. I don't think I need to go on and on about the benefits and values of forest land to this, to this audience. Uh, I think you do know. But it's, you know, a range of things from uh, uh, habitat, biodiversity, connectivity, um, atmospheric carbon um, mitigation, sequestration, storage, um, water quality, water supply, flood resilience, um, and outdoor recreation, the tourism economy of our state, there's, there's like the nat natural infrastructure for those things. And I haven't even mentioned the one and a half billion dollars of annual economic activity, the $30 million paid annually to Vermont landowners in stumpage. Um, you know, that's a significant part of our economy and it's bedrock for our rural economy and our culture. 
Um, and it all comes from the forest. Enormous public benefit, mostly from private, from mostly private land. Uh, I just can't give it up for the private landowners enough. Um, and, um, and so that, that begins the state of the forest kind of spiel. Um, we are forest strong. We are really lucky because of that, uh, for that. Um, and it's in relatively good shape. But we don't just have 75% of the state covered in forest land, it's in pretty darn good shape. Um, we're, you know, big picture things, no, no, no notion of sustainability begins uh, without, uh, you know, cutting less than you grow. And so our growth to removal ratio, as we call it in the state, uh, is still over two, point, two to one, over two to one. That's good, right? We're growing more than we're harvesting or removing otherwise. So that's, that's a big picture statement that that's good. Now, when I was in forestry school, it was three and a half to one. That wasn't another century, I will admit it, but it's, it's, things are changing and we probably ought to be paying attention. Which leads me to, you know, it's, we're strong because of our forest, we have all these benefits, it's in relatively good shape, um, and there are unsettling trends uh, from um, regeneration failures, Invasive plants, pests, pathogens, um, uh, uh, mortality, dieback, um, you know, sort of ecologic issues and growth issues for sure. Nothing too alarming, I don't think, just yet. I don't want to be that way, but I think there, we track them. The forest health and function is really important, and we have ways of measuring and tracking, and it's still, it, it's doing well, but there are some unsettling trends. The biggest of them, there are two big ones. Uh, I think. One is the loss of forest land. Um, it, it's happening. Uh, estimates of how much forest land we're losing now, year to year, vary, uh, depending on which model or which study, a few thousand acres to maybe 10, 11,000 acres or more every year. Um, so we don't have to quibble about which number. None of the reports say it's going in the other direction. They all say we're losing. Uh, and that's something to pay attention to. If nothing else, let's, it, for the first time in over a century, we're not accumulating, ad adding forest, we're losing forest land. That's, con that's not logging, that's not canopy gaps, that's conversion of forest to not forest, okay? And that's the most concerning threat, I think, to our forests right now. Maybe paired with I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually change it up, and I'm going to say even worse is the loss of the culture of forestry in our state. Um, fewer and fewer people from the land, of the land, and that's kind of how it got the way it is, and all those benefits. And yet that's really threatened. Um, it seriously is. I get a lot of mail, <laughs> I get a lot of calls, and our staff uh, do an amazing job of work in private lands and public lands, and they hear it back, particularly on public lands with calls for ending of all harvesting and any management on public lands. That's real. Um, that's a wildly loud statement of a cultural shift. Um, and it's, I think it's dangerous. Um, and, and, um, and every bit of what I've said here, every little piece of it, we could talk all afternoon about. This is complicated stuff. Um, it's really important stuff. Um, but I'm, gonna, I'm just trying to hit the high points because I, I, I'm going to finish up here and then maybe I'd love it if, we, if there was questions. I'm always happy to try to address that way. I know I'm getting what people are interested in. And, um, uh, you know, John said an hour and a half, but it's not going to go that long. I'm just, just kidding. Just, <laughs> John's looking at his phone over here. I'll finish with this. And I'd really, I hope that you will make, you know, questions or comments, whatever. Uh, love to engage with you. Uh, so I think was, that's a pretty mixed message, right? We, we're, we're lucky to have all these forests. They're largely in good shape. There's some unsettling trends worth paying attention to. The big ones being, um, you know, we haven't really talked a lot about market, global market forces, the loss of the low-grade um, um, buying mills in Maine, the pulp mills that have closed. Um, but uh, it's, it, it's strong, but we have some trends, and then this one of, uh, you know, the cultural shift. I would, I'm going to end on a high note and say there's, I have, what have I not mentioned here? And how could anyone talk about forests or the role of forestry in, 
right now without mentioning what? Climate change. Thank you. It, climate change. And now I want to talk about climate change. Uh, what I'm going to say about it is it's probably the best moment in, that we could possibly have for the future of forests and the role of good forestry in keeping forests forest. If not now, I'm going to hang up my boots and go, I don't know what. Uh, because this is our moment. It's, there's, forests are both vulnerable to climate change and we're seeing that now. In sort of changing of timing of things in the woods naturally and also in um, disruptions in our work with the forest and how we have to adapt to that. Uh, but, but forests are clearly the, the best solution to forest, uh, to climate change. Forests are the best solution to forests. Somebody gonna write that down? Uh, we know this. They're the lungs of the planet, and we have, um, and everyone's starting to turn and face. That's part of the problem is people say, well, geez, Commissioner, the you know, trees are good for climate change. They take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Why would you want to cut any of them down? We have to have a little bit longer conversation about how, how, how that works. That by, we're gonna, it's counterintuitive for folks. We're going to save forests and all they do for us by cutting some trees now and then and doing it thoughtfully and intelligently and I hope more locally and ecologically based. Um, but yeah, that's the premise. And it's a really good opportunity. When you think about it, the ability for forests to take it, actually take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, but to, all beyond that to the resilience against the effects of climate change that, that forests provide for us. They make us strong, they hold us together. Those of you who experienced Irene and, and its challenges and difficulties, um, that would have been way worse if we weren't so heavily forested. There's no question about it, as bad as it was. And so it's this resilience to, let, to climate change, uh, even while forests are vulnerable to climate change. And so we need to protect them, and what we know is that um, we have a long history of good conservation, the little C we call it conservation, of like easements and acquisition and protection of forest lands, but it's really the big C con conservation that we're really interested in. That includes the little C, which is all the tools and tricks that folks use to be, what I, to, to, to do what I call the, the peaceful and productive coexistence of people and forests, forestry, forest stewardship, w knowing your land, working with your land, in, a, in a, the reality of an economic, the, the economic realities, of owning and, and owning and paying for land, uh, and taking good care of it, people invest in it, that is the ticket to a resilient Vermont in a cl changing climate. And we all need to stand up and claim it, and we are pushing hard for, all, we have to protect all the things that make it so. The strong history of conservation, little C and big C, need to continue. Outreach and education that you all share with each other and our county foresters and our friends in consulting forestry do for landowners. That's great. We have to continue to build on it. I'll continue to learn. We need to protect incentive programs like the current use program. By far the most important and successful conservation program in our state's history. And we need to champion sustainable, ecologically-based forestry, and we need to modernize and invest in um, a modern forest economy. When we make forest products, and I'd say world-class food products, we make Vermont. We make it what it is. And that's why it looks the way it does today. And the culture of forestry and the economics of forestry are at the core of that. Um, and they're both really in trouble. And I think this climate change reality is actually the, the good news, oddly, that um, I think the world, uh, the, our country, uh, when you think about floods and fires, um, even all the way back to our region and our state and our towns, people are starting to turn and face, we're really lucky to have this forest land. And we need to all be sort of all hands on deck as we think about policy change in a climate context to, to think about supporting those things that support forests that support us. I hope that makes sense. I hope I didn't bum you all out. Um, and thank you all again for, for, for what you do as VWA. I'd be happy, thank you. A question for the commissioner? Yes, sir. On 
around the uh, loss of the culture surrounding forestry and uh, support, supporting it, how, how much to uh, how much of effect does people not living in Vermont have on the loss of that culture? People that have second homes here. Yeah, I, I uh, it's a factor. Uh, it's got to be. Uh, I don't pretend to know a lot about. Certainly not going to claim to know their motivations and their philosophies, but uh, there's a lot of them. And it stands to reason that if they're not really here, what is their connection? I think there are many of them. I think some foresters here would probably work with some who would say, no, 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 they are super into this. And it's, it's everything for them. They just can't be here. Um, so I don't know. I think it's mixed. I'm guessing that some, you know, so from, from away, just uh, own for different reasons, maybe. Probably uh, some of the room. Right. So there you go. I'm sure glad I said that apart about them being really into it. <laughs> well, I, you know, honestly, I don't know. I think it's, it's certainly worth considering. Um, that said, you know, we've benefited from people coming from away, uh, and, you know, Johannes would be an example, his family, um, and become Vermonters, and then become iconic Vermonters, so, fascinating. We got one more, sure. Yeah. I see quite a uh, conflict between uh, development and forestry, and particularly with fragmentation of forests, and I wondered if the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation has a stand that issue. Yes, uh, and that's what I mean by forest loss. What I was speaking earlier about losing forests, it's largely through fragmentation. So we have a very clear uh, position on forest fragmentation. We're against it. We're for forest health and integrity, and we have worked for many years now to push legislation that would add a reasonable uh, lens in our for forests, in our um, land use permitting and regulation schemes. We've done a lot with guiding towns, developed many, many partners in the room and others have helped create good guidance to towns when you're considering local development and the role of, you know, how, do you, how do you have human habitat and growth with healthy forest habitats? Um, there, there are ways. And we have put a lot of work into showing that. We've also done a lot of work to advance legislation that would add that lens at the Act 250 level uh, in a way that, uh, trying to find a way to do that, that um, isn't overly burdensome or regulatory, but that gets that sweet spot of um, balance and um, valuing forests and what they do for us, while recognizing private property rights, because they're both really critical. It's not easy, but we do have a strong, firm position on it. I'm going to be honest with you, it was made reference that I went from one governor and the second one appointed me, Governor Scott asked about, he asked me this question in his interview with me. And Woody, and I told him much the same. And I said, I think we have a chance to push uh, on support for forestry and enterprises that add value to forest products, forest businesses, as our, the last piece of the puzzle for holding together forest lands. It's why he kept me on, because we agree it's a problem, it threatens, everything I talked about is threatened by it. And we need to have thoughtful approaches to avoiding it. Even though we live in a, the real world of economics and private property rights, it is not easy. If that makes sense, just being super honest with you. Route 91 in Thetford, and all day long I see logging trucks from Quebec headed north, and all day long I see the, probably the same trucks headed south with lumber. And I just can't figure out why we can't seem to uh, create sawmills in Vermont that would save all that diesel fuel and keep the value of the timber here rather than going across the border. Sure, agree with you. Make the same observations. Uh, we all do. Uh, there's some reasons, you know, they're not, they're not justifications. I mean, they kind of explain why it happens. There's a, it's not an uneven playing field. Uh, the mills lined up across the border are there for a reason, and they're very much subsidized, and they have health care, and energy is cheap, and uh, there's a lot of advantages there. Um, and let's face it, you know, for, for me as a landowner, at least it provides a market for my timber. I can sell to someplace. 
We do have mills in Vermont, fortunately still. We've lost an unbelievable, in the last 25 years, 40% uh, of our milling capacity, and it's shrinking further. We still have a, a, a handful of mills that uh, have toured recently, for example, that are investing and being really thoughtful about their businesses, which is great. Um, but that's what we're talking about, is how do we keep the ones we have, allow them to remain or become profitable, grow, and then attract new businesses, sawmills and other wood using value adders. Because why do we want to send it there for value adding? Um, so agreeing and saying that that really is one of the issues. It's like how do we re retool, especially in, with the loss of the low grade markets in, in Maine, Former Deputy Commissioner Lincoln, he, he, he coined this, it's really brilliant. He, he's like, well, what right-thinking Vermonter would put, put all our sap into tankers and send them to Maine for value adding into syrup? Well, that's kind of what we've been doing for a really long time with pulping. And um, we're not pulping facilities here, but we're, we're really curious about other markets for low-grade, rebuilding some. In a, in a mixed sort, sort of portfolio. Uh, and I do believe that getting back to the, we still have some pretty strong manu wood manufacturing in the state too. And I think there's, so that's what I mean, there's opportunities to kind of modernize and turn towards the future. And let's say to people, an example is in, in legislation for Act 250, uh, we've made the case that it really needs to be a change in how we consider enter businesses that add value to forest products. Um, because we're losing them for a reason. This is part of the reason. And we got to think of a, a sawmill, a kiln, a firewood processor, whatever, uh, not like a box store when it comes to Act 250. We need to think of them for their conservation effect, because they do. F for every thousand feet of wood that comes in, that's acres being conserved and maintained and stewarded and cycling that money locally. That is a really good deal, and it's extremely different from Walmart or anything else. But that's how it's treated. As, as industry and as something to be feared and to be avoided. And we're utterly dependent on them. So, you know, getting into the weeds a bit to give you a couple examples about how very right you are, it's something we're working on. It's the best example you could give of like where we need to focus on rebuilding and modernizing. And part of that is the culture of having people support that. Okay, you're gonna shut me off. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Is there an IT person in the house? Just, just want to make sure we don't mess this thing up while it's working. I think we're ready to continue. You know, forest landowners own their property for numerous reasons and probably no single one reason alone uh, you know uh, describes that and survey after survey by forest economists and forest sociologists study these sorts of trends in, in human interests and survey after survey comes back as one of the leading reasons that people own their forest land is for wildlife the other reasons are valuable as well, too, but wildlife, time and time again, comes out on top. And for that to be meaningful in a biological sense, in a state like Vermont that's as forested as it is, that requires habitat, forest habitat. And with a state that's largely owned by private landowners, that falls to the private landowners to support those wildlife species that depend upon the forest. And so, in this group especially, I couldn't think of someone more appropriate to present to you information and enlightenment about the, the value of everyone's forest land and the contribution that that makes to the overall resilience and, and the benefits of wildlife that we, we enjoy in this state. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce my former colleague and, and, and a 30-plus uh, year veteran 
of Wildlife Habitat Management and Wildlife Habitat Science, Mr. John Austin. Thank you, John. I've, I've got the $50 here. I'll, I'll get that to you for that very kind introduction. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, John and I worked together for, for many, many years, decades, in fact, in the Fish and Wildlife Department, and um, John's a, a dear friend and a, and a valued colleague, and, and he could give this presentation better than I can, so um, I'll, I'll do my best. There's a couple of tough acts to follow. Where did, uh, there they are, back there, the, the previous speakers. Um, they've, they've really set a high bar, so I'll, I'll do the best I can. And I think, so John asked me to talk with you all today about this concept of ecological connectivity or habitat connectivity, really how we understand the larger uh, connected forest landscape of Vermont and the region and what that means in terms of forest health and integrity, as well as what it means for fish and wildlife conservation. So um, I'm gonna go through briefly sort of a basic overview of what we mean by this concept of landscape and ecological connectivity. We'll think about it in sort of the larger context of the region, as well as Vermont specifically. I'll look at some examples with you about how Various species of wildlife rely on the, on the connections of the Vermont landscape and what we know about all of that. And then talk a little bit about some of the things that are going on, um, both in the Fish and Wildlife Department, with our colleagues in Forest Parks and Recreation, and um, with other organizations such as this one right here that are all working to make sure that the connected landscape of Vermont and beyond um, remains intact and healthy. So, uh, with that, let me just dive in. I, here's the, the mission of the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. It's a big one. We're responsible for looking out for the, the needs and interests of all species of plants and animals in the state and, and all of the interests that the public has around that. So that's, that's a lot. And it does not happen with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department independently or alone. This is a partnership effort, conservation of fish, wildlife, forests, water, it's all a partnership effort. You're all a part of it. Forest Parks and Recreation is a big part of it. Everything we do is partnership-based. And as I go along, that will also be a bit of a theme with my, the points that I try to share with you today. But let's just think about this, this big responsibility in sort of practical terms. So there's, there's a lot of species of plants and animals that exist in the state of Vermont, never mind the surrounding region or throughout North America. And to try and look out for the needs and interests of, of all of these different species of plants and animals is simply impossible. You can't do it. And, that, and we don't even know all of the species of plants and animals that exist. So um, what do we do about that? Well, one of the ways that we approach fish and wildlife conservation is through sort of this, this lens of a coarse filter approach. Looking at the larger landscape, understanding the relationships between plants and animals, habitats, natural communities, and the conditions of the land itself, if we're able to understand it at a high level, that is, how fish, fish, wildlife, and plants interact with the larger landscape, then we can focus conservation on that larger landscape, and in doing so, look out for the needs and interests of all of these critters. So, <clears throat> I'm sure all of you have heard from one time or another this idea of a coarse filter and fine filter approach to conservation. A coarse filter meaning based essentially what I just talked about. So looking at things like forest blocks and the, and the relative condition of those forest blocks. To what extent does fragmentation affect the size and condition of those forest blocks? How are they interconnected by riparian areas, streams, wetlands, other types of natural communities? And how do you even think about things like um, unique or rare physical landscape conditions in a place like Vermont? Because as you well know, not every, not every part of the geology and soil uh, makeup of Vermont is the same. And we've got some areas in Vermont that are pretty unique, not just to Vermont, but to the region where you have calcareous uh, bedrock and, and uniquely rich soil. So, all of those things taken together um, help us understand the interactions uh, of plants and animals and, and how they support one another. 
again, getting at this, at this um, uh, more efficient approach for conservation. So, Commissioner Snyder mentioned a moment ago this, um, this uh, issue with climate change. I, I would argue it's, uh, aside from the, some of the cultural and demographic challenges and economic challenges that we face right now with uh, forest land ownership in, in Vermont, which are uh, enormous and complicated and, and significantly important, climate change is, is um, really the issue of our time. And, and figuring out how we're going to look out for the future needs of fish and wildlife and plants and forests with all the, the uh, uh, unknowns, the unpredictable nature of a changing climate is gonna be really challenging. But, and it's inherently complicated, but I'm gonna come back to this one simple point over and over again. One of the best things we can do is keep forests as forests. If we have forests, intact forests that are well connected, You'll, you'll preserve a platform for all of these ecological processes and the myriad of species that are out there to move around and adapt as, as they're gonna need to. We cannot predict that. And we can't account for how, how to move things around. It's, it's simply out of our hands. So we, we've got to make sure that we set the stage for these things to be able to move around and adapt. Uh, this concept of a resilient landscape that I'll get into more in just a moment. The, the graphs on the side there is just an illustration to show that even for millions of years, um, plants and animals have been moving around the landscape in response to all sorts of environmental changes. So in these examples, you've got American beech, you've got eastern hemlock, you've got red oak, um, and they've been progressing northward for a really long time. So it's not a new phenomenon. What is new is that there's a lot more of us on the planet there's a lot more development on the planet, so there's a lot more impediments for things to be able to move around and respond to all of these changes and perturbations. So, and it's happening at a faster rate than certainly to our knowledge it's ever happened in the past. So, um, these are important considerations. So back to the coarse filter approach. Forest blocks is a pretty obvious one. When you think about, all right, how are we gonna look out for the interests of fish and wildlife conservation broadly in an efficient way. All these different species of plants and animals. Well, let's start with forest blocks because if we can look at how to conserve those, and I say conservation in, in the largest sense, the, the big C of conservation, as Commissioner Snyder likes to, to call it. And I, I like that, that term. It's in the largest sense, meaning it's not public ownership. That's not gonna solve the problem. Um, it's, it's how we manage all of the forest land. All of you are, are really the key to success in terms of dealing with conservation and how we maintain this resilient landscape. So let's think about connectivity a little bit more. Well, all right, so we'll, we'll start off at the, at the continental scale. Maybe you've seen this slide before. It's kind of a cool slide that was produced by the Nature Conservancy. And, and it's, it's intended to just illustrate how plants and animals are going to move around North America as the climate changes. And so even though it's, it's sort of crude at this scale, and there's so many unpredictable things that could happen that this is not really that fine-tuned, one of the things that it does illustrate quite well, I think, is the significance of the Appalachian Mountains and the connection to the Acadian ecoregion, which is where we exist. So there's, there's a lot of plants and animals that are relying on what we do with the landscape along the Atlantic coast um, to make sure that they're going to be able to, to move as things change. So there's the, the continental concept of, of connectivity. All this ultimately to get us to the point where we think about how each individual landowner in the state of Vermont, New York, New Hampshire, Maine, doesn't matter where, contributes to maintaining this, this network of connected forests and natural areas. So here's a regional scale. So we've got the Northeast with our Canadian Maritime Partners. Um, this is a map maybe you've seen before. It was produced as part of the Staying Connected Initiative, which is a collection of federal and state and non-government organizations that have partnered together. It's, it's binational, so it's organizations and governments from Canada, as well as the United States. Um, in fact, some of you here have been part of this partnership. And it is looked at and drawn attention to and raised awareness about 
the importance of the connecticut landscape within this region this larger northeast region so what the map shows is both the focus area which is for the most part new york vermont new hampshire maine and up into the canadian maritimes um, and then it, it illustrates some of the larger areas that at the time this map was produced uh, we knew to be important regional connections for that larger forest landscape i would tell you that this map is is outdated and and at the time was a function of imperfect information. So it illustrates Vermont as a crossroads point for a lot of these landscape connections for, for wildlife. But actually at the time, Vermont had more information than some of our, our neighboring states. That's since changed. Um, most states in the Northeast now and some of our uh, colleagues from Canada have uh, maps that are specific to each state and show what the connected landscape looks like uh, for their jurisdiction in much more well-defined terms than, than this map shows. But nevertheless, it, what it does highlight is how we think about the connected landscape at a really big scale. Because again, we'll just keep tri drilling down in. This is great, but what really matters is who owns all the land in those areas? And what are the decisions that they're making about what's gonna happen with that land? That's, that's really where it all comes together. So uh, still thinking at sort of a regional scale about connectivity, in 2018, there was an opportunity um, to come together with the New England governors and Eastern Canadian premiers to raise their awareness about the importance of this regionally connected landscape, its contribution to biodiversity conservation, and what it means to support our interests in being able to adapt and be resilient to the changing climate. So, the governors and premiers, they have an association, they meet every year and they deal with all sorts of various policy interests that are regional in scope from economic to uh, transportation to the environment. And uh, in this case, they, they were really keen to reflect their interests in this larger connected landscape. What it means to the region in terms of an economic sense, a public health sense, um, just a sense of place and the, the value to the culture of people who live in these states and provinces. And so it's basically a policy statement that um, set very strong standards for an interest in making sure that the forested landscape of this region uh, remains intact. And, you know, it's, it's a policy statement and those things only go so far. But um, over the past five years since it was signed, there, well, there, first of all, there were expectations laid out in this, in this proclamation. It, it said, we're gonna direct all the states and provinces to work together and think about, one, how do we define the connected landscape? We want a unified vision for what it looks like. So dig into the science, states and provinces, and tell us what does it mean? And what does it look like? So we can have a vision for where we are today, and we can have a vision for success 50 years from now. In addition, it said you want all the states and provinces to figure out how you're going to work together to advance conservation interests through things like land use planning, land conservation, land management and stewardship, that's all of us, and I would argue perhaps the most important part of that, and transportation planning. And so it, it made directives to elements of state and provincial government to say this is what you're going to do. So there was a plan pulled together and um, you know, these things sort of move at a glacier's pace, although I guess that has a different monotone these days. It's more like water dripping on a stone. Um, it doesn't move quickly. But in any event, one of the great things that's come out of it is we have created sort of a shared vision for what the regional connected landscape looks like, and the states and provinces are sharing information back and forth about what they're doing to advance conservation strategically to maintain connectivity. And I would argue that's the best outcome of this, is just the, the collaboration that has resulted so that we can be making strategic decisions regionally, not just um, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, so that the decisions Vermont makes about where to conserve land or how to provide incentives to private landowners to maintain forested land um, also are in concert with New Hampshire and Maine and Quebec and beyond, looking at the larger picture.
So we know a lot about what this connected landscape looks like around the region. There's all sorts of really smart people who have uh, taken all kinds of uh, useful data and information to map it out. A set a blueprint together for us that says, okay, here's what this connected landscape looks like for all of you. The one on the left is called Nature's Network. It was developed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. A lot of pieces of information land it, a lot of scientists work on it, work on it, and, um, and it's, it's helpful. But you'll notice that it stops at the border. But it doesn't go up into Canada, and that's one of the limitations. When all of that was being put together, Vermont had a seat at the table, and um, we had some reservations about the lack of types of information that were incorporated into the analysis. But that's near the end of there. It's a really useful map. It's a useful piece of information, and it can guide important decisions about conservation at a large scale. The one on the right, it's called the Resilient Landscape Analysis. It was produced by the Nature Conservancy. Um, that one is uh, multinational, goes into Canada. I, I will note, however, it doesn't go all the way north. I mean, one of the missing pieces in, in every analysis I've seen is nobody's looking up in northern Quebec. Nobody's really paying attention to Newfoundland Labrador. And I argue that's a mistake. We don't need to get into that now. People tend to assume that because it's so remote up there, there's very limited development, that these sorts of conservation issues aren't a problem. They actually are. And I think we need to be giving thought to you know, the connected landscape from Connecticut and Rhode Island right up to the barrens of northern Quebec and Labrador. It's, it, it's just as important. But in any event, the point is, there's a lot of useful information out there to understand what this connected landscape looks like. This can inform our conservation decisions. So now we'll look at uh, the great state of Vermont. What do we know about the connected landscape of Vermont and what it means to our interests in forest health and integrity and wildlife movement and conservation? A um, number of years ago, I don't know, five, six years ago, there were a number of folks from Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, my department, the Fish and Wildlife Department, the Nature Conservancy, the Mountain Land Trust, and, and others who had expertise in um, landscape and forest ecology got together and did a similar analysis to the ones I showed you on the previous slide, but more specific to Vermont. So we took all the information we have on forest rocks, all of the information we have on our riparian system, our wetland systems, our natural community systems, our rare and unique um, bedrock and geology types, all this different information is pulled together and people far brighter than me analyzed it all to come up with a map that we call Vermont Conservation Design. So it's a map, I'll show it to you in just a second, but it's a map similar to what we were just looking at, but it's specific to Vermont. One of the really cool things is, I think every state in the Northeast now has done a similar mapping effort. So um, they've all done it a little bit differently, but they're, but they're all compatible enough that we've got some really great information to be making some good strategic decisions on conservation at, at this sort of larger scale. So this is what it looks like, Vermont Conservation Design. Just, I'm just curious, how many folks here have heard of Vermont Conservation Design or this product before? Great, thank you. Um, so it, it's still relatively new, and the idea is that it is simply a piece of information to inform all of us, landowners, um, government, people who are making land acquisition decisions, what have you, about uh, sort of the landscape condition of the state. So what it shows you is if you drill it, if, this is available on the Agency of Natural Resources website. You can find it, it's listed as uh, under the BioFinder tag, which is a tool on the website that gives you all, access to all kinds of information. Um, so pull up Vermont Conservation Design and play around with it. It's, it's pretty cool as you drill in. You can see all of the various specific details of the forest blocks and the connections and the stream systems and the natural communities and all that cool stuff. But I will say, and I hope, I hope Commissioner Snyder won't hold this against me, but um, if you went back 20 years ago, you know, some of us have been at this a long time in, in state government, Went back 20 years ago, there was simply no appetite for a map like this to exist. There were too many 
uh, there were concerns about the perceptions that a map like this could create, that this is a government land grab, that we want this to um, you know, guide what we're going to do or how we're going to influence things on private land. Well, I, so a couple of things. One is I think we're very fortunate to be in a position today where we have uh, support from now two different administrations, both uh, a Democratic governor, a Republican governor, both of whom have stood behind this sort of science as a useful tool to guide, in, to guide decisions, um, to guide potential opportunities. This is not a map for, for government uh, ownership of land, anything but. It, get, it gets back to Commissioner Snyder's concept of the big sea of conservation. This is another piece of information amongst lots of pieces of information that we all use to make complicated decisions about what are you going to do with your land. And so I'll show you an example of, of how you could use this. Now, I think this next slide, yeah, this next one is a really cool um, compilation of layers that I'm going to go through that was created by your president, Mr. Thompson, back there. Uh, and it's, it's a, I think it's a really cool illustration of how to use this sort of information. And it's close to home. So here's that regional scale, the connected landscape uh, of the Northeast. And in the middle there, I just pulled up Vermont. So there's the state of Vermont highlighted. And you can see there is some of the forest block information that's part of Vermont conservation design coming up. So we're going to drill in further and further from the regional scale to the state scale. Now let's look at where we are right now. This is pretty close to where we're sitting at, at this moment in Waterbury and Stowe. Um, and we'll drill in a little further. Now you're able to begin to see the, the value of the information that's part of Vermont conservation design. It's beginning to show you some of the unique forested connections amongst these larger forest blocks. And so here, there's, we're right up there. There's Interstate 89. That's where I got off to come over here today, backed up about a mile onto the interstate. Um, and the area that's surrounded in yellow is what we call the Shootsville Hill uh, area, right in the Waterbury Stowe town line. And we discovered through the course of this analysis, although I think people living in the area already knew this, that that was a really unique connection to this larger matrix of forest from the Worcesters uh, on the east to the Mount Mansfield State Forest on the west. It actually is, is uh, in, except for when you go south of 89. North of 89, you've got to go quite a ways further north before you find another intact area of forest that connects this larger matrix of forest. This actually turns out to be an area of regional significance. So if we want to make sure that plants and animals are able to move around the landscape, ultimately north up into the Northeast Kingdom, northern New Hampshire, the Gaspé Peninsula, turns out this is a really important connection. And the communities have done uh, just an amazing job of rallying around this. I think it started before we had a, a Verizon cell tower case. We don't need to go into that, but you, somebody mentioned Act 250 earlier in the 248 process with the Public Utility Commission. Believe it or not, this is where some of this information comes into play. It guides decisions in all sorts of ways. And it's, I think it's, that's part of the really useful value of this kind of information is that it enables us to make decisions about how to site development, for instance, um, thoughtfully. So in any event, you can just see at a different level here um, the Shootsville Hill connection and, and why that becomes so important, important for wildlife movement between Mansfield and the Worcester Ranch. So I, I really would encourage you, if you haven't already, um, pull up Vermont Conservation Design through BioFinder. It, it's a lot of fun to play around with. You can zoom into where you live or areas that you know and are fascinated by and, and just see what it looks like. Um, so this is going to show you, um, just put into uh, context, the scale of forest patches relative to the types of wildlife that they support. So it's a pretty simple concept, right? The bigger the forest patch, 
the greater the diversity of wildlife that can exist there. And as those patches grow smaller, their ability to support some species is, is diminished. So here's, so we'll look at it by block size. So if you have forest blocks that are five, this is very crude. I'm going to admit right up front, this is not a one size fits all. This is not how it always works. We all know that you're going to see some of these species of wildlife in developed areas. It happens. Their behavior is as complicated as our behavior, and they're unpredictable sometimes, and where you're going to find them and what they're going to do. But generally speaking, some of these critters need their space from us. So having big areas of forest are important as a general rule of thumb. As, you, as the forest blocks get smaller, you just start to see some of the species drop off the list. Again, it's a general concept. It's not, it's not a guarantee. And down to 20 and 100 acres, and then 1 to 20 acres, you, you really just start to uh, support those species that are highly adaptable to living in a human-developed landscape. So <clears throat> I thought this was pretty cool. So if we, if we just take that premise, that as forest patches get smaller, their ability to support wildlife, and I would say other forest ecosystem processes, is diminished. Well, let's think about what we have around the region, or Vermont specifically, for large forest blocks. And we'll start with um, areas that are 20 acres or greater. Looks pretty green. That's a good thing. Well, here's what it looks like when you get to 500-acre blocks. Um, it's not bad, but it ain't what the other one was. And here's 2,000-acre blocks. So you get the point. Um, these large forest blocks in Vermont in the Northeast, they're not a lim limitless commodity. There's, there's only so much of it to go around, and the folks who own those, are owners of part of those forest blocks, are, are pretty darn integral to uh, conservation success moving forward. And there's 5,000 acres or greater. So let's think about what this connected landscape means to certain species of wildlife in Vermont. We, can, we could talk about any number of species. I've thrown a couple of examples up here for, for you folks to consider. Um, this one is with Bobcat. And the, the department undertook a study with the University of Vermont, I don't know, 10 years ago. We wanted to get a better understanding for how an animal like the Bobcat, which is a wide-ranging carnivore, um, our initial inclination was to think that they were averse to being around people and develop landscapes, and so we really wanted to understand what that meant because that could inform land use decisions. So we collared, put GPS collars on a bunch of bobcats uh, in various parts of the state. A lot of them in the Champlain Valley, it turned out, because bobcats like to eat rabbits, and there's a lot of rabbits in the Champlain Valley. So this is an illustration of, of one of these cats who took up residence on the south end of Shelburne. And they were using this area of wetlands here. Let's pull up these arrows. Um, big wetland system feeds into the La Platte River and ultimately into Lake Champlain and Shelburne Bay. And some surrounding forest patches, it's near Shelburne Farms, it's loaded with small animals, rabbits in particular. And that's why the bobcats were there. It was a very attractive source of food for them. So they, they figured out how to eke out a living in there. It was worth their time to figure this out because the value of the food to them was so important. But the re only reason it worked is because they still had access to get in and out of there when the need arose, because there's a lot of pressures on them in there. There's, people recreating, there's dogs, there's development, there's traffic, there's a lot going on in there. But there's, a, there's enough open space for them to, to eke out a living. But look at what they're using to move around. All these yellow dots are telemetry locations. As this cat's moving around, uh, it's pinging off satellites, and that's what these dots represent. So each dot is a location of that animal at a particular moment in time. It's showing you where it was moving around. Well. 
it's using fence roads and hedgerows in that otherwise agriculture and developed environment to, to get in and out. And it actually has enough connection to areas further south of Shelburne where you've got larger patches of forested habitat and a little bit less development where they can find refuge when they need to. So it's the attraction of the food, but it's still the connections, even at this scale, that enable that an animal like the bobcat, which moves great distances, even over the course of a short period of time, to, to eke out a living here. John, how am I doing on time? OK. <laughs> Here's another example. This is. Um, a telemetry study that we did on black bears, it's actually just wrapping up now. I think it's the second or third telemetry study we've done on black bears in Vermont to understand their behavior and movements relative to human activity and development. So this was done in uh, conjunction with the development of the Deerfield Wind Project. We wanted to get a better understanding for how bears would react to this new industrial scale wind energy development it's in prime bear habitat country in southern Vermont. This, the yellow dots are the same thing. They're point locations for where that one bear was a six or seven year old male was moving around. So he, that bear was in those various locations. Um, and you can see over the course of one month, this time of the year, when bears are really actively feeding, trying to get as much fat as they possibly can before going into den for the winter, um, pretty critical time, that bear was willing to move 140 kilometers in a pretty short period of time in order to access important sources of food. So again, and look at its relationship to uh, Route 9. And oddly, it was, it was one of the few times in the course of this study, and we've had, I don't know, 30-some bears collared down there, where one of the bears got that close to Brattleboro. I'm not quite sure why that bear decided to do that, but um, you can see that he didn't stay there very long. And so one of the things this illustrates is not just the wide-ranging nature of these animals and why it's so important for them to be able to move around, but their relationship to roads and development. We also know from, from previous studies, one at the Stratton ski area a long time ago, that um, bears are really selective in terms of where they decide to cross roads. They don't tend to cross roads just anywhere uh, if they have the choice. They figure out areas that have short lines of sight and dense vegetation on each side of the road. So where they cross roads, it's really important that they've got good habitat on both sides of it. Otherwise, what's the point? Just another illustration, all these yellow points, they're, they're um, GPS points for where that bear occurred on the landscape at a particular moment in time. This one just showing that bear didn't care whether it was in Vermont or Massachusetts. It was looking for food. It, it was an uh, adult female. Um, and it was moving long distances also over a relatively short period of time. So again, it's got to be able to move around in order to meet, meet its life needs. Here's a pretty cool map that shows you what we know right now about the genetic variability of the black bear population in the state of Vermont. There, it's, not, it's not consistent. There appears to be unique genetic compositions of populations of bears depending on where you are in the state. And while we don't know cause and effect for sure, one of the things that we begin to see is a pattern of where these populations exist relative to roads, major roads, state highways, and the interstate system. Um, so it isn't to say that those roads define the genetic variability or, or lack thereof of, of subpopulations of bears, but it is to suggest that it could have an effect on that. And that's one of the things that we always want to be guarded about is the sort of the so-called island effect of populations. If, they, if animals don't have the ability to move around and exchange genetic material, then ultimately their fitness goes down. That's not a good thing for them. How many more minutes, John? Five? OK. A um, couple of things that we're doing right now. So, one, you got to deal with roads and development. We, we've worked for years and years with the Vermont Agency of Transportation to try and understand wildlife's relationship to state roads in Vermont, and how we can improve circumstances for animals to move across or under those roads. In this instance, it's a tunnel that was installed on a road, state highway in, in Moncton, Vermont, 
to move amphibians and other wildlife underneath the road. It happened to be an area where you get these annual mass migrations of frogs and salamanders over the road. Now they're all safely going under the road. The fence is direct into that opening, and it's absolutely astounding the tens of thousands of salamanders and frogs that move under that road now. It was a worthwhile investment guided by good science. Um, this is the Bennington Bypass. We don't build many new roads in Vermont these days, but this one was probably 15, 20 years ago. And when it went through the permitting process, we worked with VTRANS, Vermont Agency of Transportation, to understand how we could construct a new state highway in an area that was previously undeveloped and make sure that wildlife were able to continue to move around. So actually there's a number of large bridges and oversized culverts that are part of that, that uh, transportation system down there that are designed specifically to move animals into the roads. I'm gonna go by that. So I, because of limited time, I'm gonna wrap up with, with this. All the work we're doing on with VTRANS on roads, the work that we do as state agencies to buy land to support public interests, um, it's all important. It's really important stuff. But, but none of that really compares, and to some extent, with like, with like the road crossing uh, work, it, it doesn't matter if private landowners aren't also part of that program. It, it is private landowners who own roughly 80% of the state where conservation success rests. So if you put in a tunnel, but it's the, the tunnel to nowhere, or the bridge to nowhere, as Sarah Palin would have said, um, it doesn't matter, it was a poor investment. So it's all about what happens on private land, and I, uh, I would just end by uh, applauding all of you for having such wonderful interests in being excellent stewards of Vermont's forest and landscape. You all and all the other private landowners in Vermont um, are why Vermont is such a special place and why it is still a healthy environment that, that supports all of these unique and wonderful uh, ecosystem processes. So thanks to all of you for, for what you're doing to advance that sort of conservation work. I'm going to call it there. Sure. And that includes just about all the forest animals. So not, there's so few 5,000 acre blocks in and of themselves that makes those 20 acre blocks so important. It makes all of us so important in this habitat connectivity need for viability for all the wildlife populations. Well, let's move on to our final speaker for this afternoon before we break for a moment and then uh, we will uh, begin our tribute to Pat Logic. Oh, great. This is all good. Um, so I did turn on that view so we can't hold it here and help. Can you still hear it? I could can you still hear it? And I could turn the other one on if you need a little more. Oh, good so far. If it gets, if it gets too loud, we can turn off the line. I mentioned briefly uh, before John, John uh, Austin came on about only landowner surveys that are conducted here in New York and mentioned that wildlife and nature are kind of kind of again the number one reason people have for forest ownership. But the second most important reason, and they're all integrated, is access mm -hmm. to those wildlife so they can go enjoy nature, enjoy their property. They were very, very much interested and in need of trails to get them through the woods for, and, and the trails and the woods roads uh, that service the property. So our next speaker, John Morton, is a international foremost expert on trail design. John is a storied history of service to our country. He is an Olympic athlete. He is an Olympic coach, an NCAA cross country coach. And most recently, in the last several decades, as I said, an internationally renowned designer of recreation trails, uh, scaling from 20 acre landowners who wish to have a great walking path behind the house to international governments designing biathlon trails for their next Olympic Games. And so I can go on and on and on, but we're going to leave the job. Just leave the other job. Yeah. And, and so it's my great pleasure to introduce just you to Mr. John. Enter Moore. when you enter. want to. Okay. Wherever that is. Yeah. Thank you.
Well, thanks. Thanks very much for the opportunity here. Um, if I figure out how to do this thing here, right? Okay. So a little bit of personal background first. Uh, I skied from Middlebury back in the uh, wooden ski and knicker socks era. Uh, they had an ROTC at the time, and so I had a military commitment, but I was able to uh, get into the Biathlon Training Center at Fort Richardson, Alaska. Uh, that led me to a couple of Olympics, 72 in Sapporo and 76 in Innsbruck. And uh, in, in that interim, uh, five Biathlon World Championships. And uh, then I ended up at uh, coaching the Dartmouth ski team for 11 years. And actually, I was happy to see one of uh, Dartmouth's former great alpine skiers here in the audience today, Bobby Hill. Um, and then uh, I, when I decided to leave the coaching, I really didn't have a clue what I was going to do next. And I just lucked into this, what has turned out to be a wonderful um, gig. I wouldn't, I'm not sure I'd call it a career, but um, this little niche of designing trails. And I have no background in engineering or, or landscape architecture. The only thing that, that gave me a little bit of a start was that I had skied almost everywhere you could ski cross country, in Asia, in all over Europe, uh, Soviet Union, all over North America. And that gave me a, a good start. And there, there are um, five stages, generally speaking, of recreational trail development. First is a conceptual design and layout, and a lot of the trails, and sort of unfortunately, I think, that we all experience uh, throughout this country uh, have the misfortune of just evolving without much planning. They might have been under a power line to begin with. They might have been uh, an old forest road. They might have been a skid trail. And somebody said, hey, we can follow that. And then we can cut through the woods 100 yards. And then we can come back on the power line and it doesn't really make for great recreational experience in comparison to, say, what you'd find in Scandinavia. The second phase is cutting and clearing, which uh, you're all familiar with. Third is construction. And in former uh, decades or, or generations, the, the concept of a trail was a, a very narrow path in the woods. And a lot of trails were constructed simply with a pair of nippers cutting off branches and maybe a little bit of earthwork. But that's changed recently for a number of reasons. Finishing usually involves uh, signage, uh, maps, uh, maybe uh, some sort of uh, a raking of the trail, perhaps uh, seeding with conservation mix, something like that. And then finally, ongoing maintenance. And, and I'll talk a little bit about all of those. Uh, it's ironic in a way and, and uh, gratifying to me to be here at the uh, Trap Family Lodge because this uh, project here, first of all, as many of you know, um, the Trap Family Lodge is the first destination Nordic center in North America. And Johannes is a little bit humble uh, uh, when he was speaking earlier and didn't mention that. But it was the first place in North America where uh, people came here specifically for cross-country skiing. One of the issues uh, that evolved here was that they have a, a number of recreational trails that go out through the woods, which you, many of you walked earlier today. And through the years, that became also a facility for uh, competitions, uh, largely involving a University of Vermont ski team, and local high school ski teams, or regional ski teams. The dilemma was that when those events were going on, the, the paying guests at the Trap Family Lodge were inconvenienced because sometimes the, the trails that they had hoped or anticipated to ski were being blocked off because of the competitions. Also internationally, the, the International Ski Federation had started to create what they call homologation guidelines so that athletes skiing in different parts of the world wouldn't be blindsided by some horrendous um, two kilometer hill or something. All of the trails, regardless of where they are in the world, have to 
meet these different guidelines. So um, Johannes was, was eager to have a, a race course here that would be good for spectators, would meet the international guidelines, and would also not conflict with the um, recreational trails that the guests at the lodge enjoyed skiing. So this is uh, what we came up with. And it also, the, the rest of the trail system here fulfills other objectives of a, a, a trail, a typical trail system. One of those objectives, which is most important, is people love to get out on a trail without having to drive someplace. So if that, you're at a resort or a community um, or a development, it's a big advantage if folks can just leave their home and perhaps walk a short distance and get on a trail. That's, that's a huge advantage. Um, and that's something that TRAPS offers here to, to great um, uh, degree of success. They want convenient off-road access to other destinations or uh, sites. Uh, those of you that have uh, skied here at TRAPS in the wintertime know that one of the most popular destinations here is the Slayton Pasture Cabin up high on the, on the mountainside. A lot of guests from, uh, especially those from out of state, uh, that's one of their objectives when they stay at the Track Family Lodge is to ski to the uh, Slayton Pasture Cabin, have cocoa or chili or something, and then ski back down. Another more recent destination is the brewery down the hill, um, also a popular destination. Uh, the, another um, objective is convenient locations off the site. Many of you are probably aware that the Catamount Trail, which goes the length of Vermont, the backcountry ski trail, goes through uh, the Trap Family Lodge trail system. So in addition to having good access within the the venue or, or the um, uh, resort here. They, people can stay at tracks and ski from here to Bolton Valley, for example, or, or ski more. And then finally, as I mentioned at the start, um, it's nice to have a, an event venue that's created with the events in mind. And, it, and that's not just limited to comp competitions. One of the most popular events they've had here in uh, former times and I presume it still goes on, is uh, I think it's uh, ski, for, ski for Life or um, Relay for Life, thank you. So uh, there, they have a number of different events um, th that are not competitive, but draw a lot of people um, and oftentimes do uh, wonderful work for various charities. Uh, more specific trail considerations are, are one of the landowner's objectives. Uh, one of the first trails I did was for a retired couple in northern New Hampshire. They had a nice old farm, a couple of hundred acres, and uh, but they were getting, getting on in years, even though they were avid skiers. And the wife took me aside earlier and said, I want you to make this the most challenging trail you can create on our property. And they, and they had some real terrain on the property. And I said, really? You sure? She said, yep. I've got four sons, three of whom ski competitively in high school and college. And I want a trail that every time um, they have an opportunity to go somewhere to ski, this is the place they want to come back to, to ski. And so that was, that was her objective. I had another. Um, client down in southern Vermont, western, western Vermont, again, a, a retired couple, they had also challenging terrain, and he made it very clear they didn't have to get to the high point on their property. They just wanted a nice loop that they could walk or ski or snowshoe with their grandchildren when the grandchildren uh, uh, visited. So it's important to know what the, the objectives of the landowners are. You, uh, this is something I've learned the hard way. You want to be very clear on where the property lines are, where the boundaries are. Very embarrassing to go flagging a trail off on the neighbor's land. And it's surprising, uh, I don't suppose this is an issue with many of you in this room, but it's surprising how many landowners are not really clear about where their boundaries are. 
and they'll say, oh yeah, yeah, they follow the stone wall down there and then it sort of disappears. And, but you'll see evidence of the old um, barbed wire fence. And uh, if you better, you want to be very clear about where the boundaries are. Having said that, oftentimes the neighbors will be equally as enthusiastic about a trail project. So you, if, if you get involved with uh, developing a trail, and especially if you have some feature on your land, like a severe uh, hill or cliff or a pond, and, and you don't um, own land around it, sometimes the neighbor is, is very cooperative and willing to participate in the project. Uh, early on, identify any natural features or, or significant um, aspects of the property, like vistas or uh, ponds or that sort of thing possible destinations. And I would say most, uh, I was speaking to someone here earlier that, that confirmed this, most people prefer a loop for a, a recreational outing rather than an out and back. And sometimes out and back routes make total sense uh, because of the terrain or because of uh, you know, limited uh, property. Or there, there are a number of reasons why it makes sense. Having said that, if you can create a loop, generally that's more enjoyable. And it also allows you to establish one-way traffic. And that's not uh, significant for, for walking or snowshoeing, but it is significant for cross-country skiing and for mountain biking or fat tire biking. Anything that involves any amount of speed, I'd really emphasize uh, one-way traffic. Uh, you also want to think about who your potential trail users are, and um, they, it, it obviously can, can uh, include anyone from young uh, school children all the way to senior citizens, but the, the potential users will dictate to a certain degree the, the actual uh, technical aspects of the trail, how long it is, you know, if you have if most of your trail users are going to be elementary school kids, they're probably not going to have the time to go on a, say, two or three kilometer trail. Uh, they'll, they'll be much happier to, and they'll have only the available time during their school day uh, to do a much shorter loop. Um, it's, you can always create cutoffs. I, I, I like the concept of stack loops, so you have a shorter loop, an extension off that, an extension off that. That allows the loops closest to the starting and finishing point to be more gentle, more mellow for the people of, of let's say, more modest ability. And then the, the extensions farther out can be more challenging for the uh, more advanced people. And then you want to think about what activities uh, the, the trail might accommodate. And they'll, they can accommodate a lot of different activities. My background is in Nordic skiing, and I'm, I admit to being sort of prejudiced that way. I believe that a, a well-designed, well-constructed trail for Nordic skiing is very suitable for most of these other activities. The two exceptions might be um, mountain biking, as, as many of you know, has become really interesting in terms of it's fragmented into a number of different sort of specialities. You have these down mountain trails at, at alpine ski areas where everybody gets armored up with all kinds of, uh, you know, padding and protective gear and helmets and they're going off really technical jumps and highly banked turns and so forth. But I think there are a, a, another whole group of mountain bike enthusiasts that would be perfectly happy to ride on some of the ski trails that you walked on earlier today. They're not uh, as narrow and as technical, but they still have the same kind of flow and, and, and enjoyable terrain. Here are a couple of uh, tips that I guess I've picked up through the years in terms of designing trails. Uh, First, focus on the elevation changes. The most significant thing about recreational trail design for non-motorized activities has to do with elevation changes. You want to make the climbs manageable, and by and large, you'd like to keep 
people guessing as to how long the climb is. If any of you have either hiked or skied out west on, on some of the Forest Service roads out there, some of the Forest Service roads are beautiful. They're very well engineered. They're, ter they're terrifically built, probably at significant expense. But you can see forever. And, and some of if you were to ski in places like Montana or Wyoming, and you're, you're uh, starting a climb, and, and you can see this climb gradually going up some side hill for the next five miles, it's very discouraging. So as much as you can, try to conceal the climbs. People keep them guessing. Break the climbs up with a short traverse or a dip. And make the downhills worth the climbs, whether it's for skiing or mountain biking or, or even walking or, or trail running. That's the fun of, of cross-country skiing. Um, is the downhills, and they can be technical. Um, they should be, and the best thing you can hear. I, I, the comment earlier about the um, the child saying, can, "When can we go back to the, you know, fun type of skiing?" The best thing that you can hear regarding Nordic skiing is some kid that comes down some wonderful long rolling descent and says to his grandfather, can we do that again? Knowing that they've got to ski all the way back up the hill to do it again. Um, uh, I showcase the, the properties, nice natural features. And then I'd say deal with the most challenging aspects of the property first. So in other words, if you know if the property is divided by a stream, and maybe the property is, you know, pick a number and say a quarter of a mile wide or something like that. Walk the stream and find the two best crossings and say, okay, we know there's a nice narrow crossing here with good high banks, great place for a bridge. Where's another place? And then you can develop your trail to those crossings rather than getting locked into something that leads you to a less desirable crossing. Trail width is a big issue. As I mentioned earlier, um, in former times, even cross-country ski trails were relatively narrow. Two little, um, you know, track, parallel tracks through the woods. And oftentimes it didn't have to involve a lot of cutting of timber, just limbing up branches, maybe removing some rocks and stumps. That's changed. It's changed for three reasons. The first one is what was discussed earlier, and, and that's climate change. And we don't get the kind of snowfalls that we used to get. We're all aware of that. So it's very important that you open the canopy enough so that whatever snow falls actually reaches the ground, if skiing is one of your top objectives. And the second thing that sort of fits into that equation, some of you may be aware of the fact that in the early 1980s, one of our fellow Vermonters, Bill Koch, basically pioneered the skating technique in cross-country skiing. That changed everything for, cross, for the sport. And now, uh, if you want to both accommodate classic or kick and glide technique, and skating technique, you're looking at a, a trail surface probably 12 to 14 feet wide. So in the international standards, where they are doing a lot of mass start racing, um, those trails are uh, 30 feet wide on the climbs, 20 feet wide on the descents. So that three skaters can, complete, uh, can compete side by side without impeding each other. Okay, cutting and clearing. So here's, this is where um, you folks are, are understand all about this. Typically, uh, the clients I end up with, they don't want to cut any trees. They would love to have a nice, beautiful trail going through their woods, but they don't want to cut any trees. What, what I try to convince them is that very often, their woods could actually be improved if they do a little bit of, you know, harvesting, a little timber stand improvement. 
So there's two approaches to this. If you want to, if it's a, a very healthy, um, relatively mature forest, and you really want the aesthetics of the, the big mature trees, you can thread the trail through the uh, nice, healthy, existing trees. On the other hand, if the whole property could stand a thinning and you could coordinate with your consulting forester, then you can just put the trail through the openings created by the trees that are harvested for the, um, the timber harvest. You can take either approach is, is equally as successful. The issue of existing uh, woods, roads, and skid trails. So I don't know how many times I've been approached by landowners that say, we'd like you to come and connect our existing skid roads and, and logging trails so that we can have a nice ski trail. Oftentimes, it, it, it oftentimes works to some degree, but all of you know that if it's difficult terrain, the objective of the skid trail is to get the timber out in the most direct, most efficient way. And that's usually down the fall line. That's not the best uh, orientation for a cross-country ski trail. It's possible sometimes to include sections of existing skid roads and, and logging trails. But my recommendation would be if you're going to create a trail, a recreational trail, don't be um, drawn into saying, well, we've got this um, logging road here already, and let's just use that, and then we'll just supplement it with some connections, because then you're sacrificing the quality of the recreational trail. It's fine to include um, those existing trails when it advances the recreational trail project, but don't sacrifice the quality of the recreational trail just because you've got some existing skid roads. And, and many of you will find that some of those existing skid trails are not sustainable any that, that some of them have been degraded um, and you're better off um, creating a new route. Construction. Nowadays, the, the most effective way to create these kinds of trails we're talking about, relatively wide, say 12, 14 foot ski trails, is with a medium sized excavator. And they are extremely efficient. Probably uh, there are people in the audience here who have either used them or have used them. They're unbelievably um, versatile, efficient. They, they can pop out the stumps, uh, you know, remove boulders. One of the first jobs I had was up in northern New Hampshire, and I, I ended up getting into this boulder field, and, I, and there was just no way out, and, and the boulders were huge. There was an excavator operator on the site at the time, and at lunchtime I went back to talk to him. I said, you're going to just kill me because I, I've got myself into a bind here in this boulder field and I don't know how to get out of it. And he sat in his machine. It was the first time I'd really come, talked with anybody that was actually operating a machine. And he said, well, let me tell you something. And this was not a gigantic machine. It was average size. And he said, anything the size of a Volkswagen bug or smaller is no problem. Anything bigger than a Volkswagen bug just takes longer. <laughs> and he was absolutely right. He put the trail right through the boulder field. Like, you know, it, was, it was remarkable. Um, they, they are very effective in putting in culverts, uh, building bridges. I'm a big fan of excavators. So um, they, they are effective in terms of doing cut and fills across side hills. Um, you want to very slightly crown the, the trail surface so that as it gets more traffic, you don't end up getting a rut in the middle of it. Um, you can bank the descending turns. That's another reason why one-way traffic is uh, advisable because you can uh, bank the turns and make the downhills more fun. Finishing, uh, basically, uh, most, most of the trails, again, that, that are reasonably wide like this, are, are best finished 
Uh, and, and oftentimes the excavators these days, are, they're so skillful, you don't even have to rake the, the trail surface after they're done. Just seed it with conservation mix, and, and some people get better germination from that if they mulch on top of it. Sometimes you can just seed it and, and maybe rake it once and it will grow just fine. And then the, also part of the finishing is putting up good signage. One of the things that Johannes mentioned here, which I think is definitely true, is a lot of people are just, uh, if, they're, if they don't grow up in this part of the country or, or with access to the forest, they're, they're uneasy about getting out in the woods if they don't know where they are. So having just trail markers uh, on trees so that they can always see a trail marker and having good signs, that's very reassuring to people who aren't commonly in the woods. Um, I did, did a trail a number of years ago for a retirement community down in Lebanon, New Hampshire, and, and they had sort of a group project of how, how to um, design and uh, come up with these trail markers. And I thought they had a wonderful idea in that they, they used um, these images of different birds, but then they made a, a, a sort of a double um, uh, uh, sign in that they had color coding. So they, they both had an image of a particular bird and, and the color coding, so that can work well. Ongoing maintenance is, is pretty much the same as you would ha have within your um, woodlots. Uh, if the the trail is properly built and, and drained, and good culverts and swales on the uphill side of the thing. All you basically have to do is mow it. Uh, I've, I've got a flail mower for, on my tractor, which is terrific. It, it, I, I feel like it does a better job than, the, than a bush haul. And, and it's what the same sort of thing you see the mowing the, the interstate uh, median strips. And uh, just you know, occasionally move, remove the branches that fall down, and you're going to have some of that. You're going to have a couple of trees that get uprooted and fall across the trail. It's very important to check the culverts a couple of times a year. Just make sure they don't get clogged up, because they will. And uh, a clogged culvert can, if you have one of these severe rainstorms, uh, that can be a problem. Um, you're going to get some, um, a lot of people are nervous when I'm talking about trails as wide as, um, as they should be for Nordic skiing, but they grow in fast, and it's important to kind of keep, it, keep them cut back. And you can almost always get volunteers to help you. Uh, people who are, enjoy being out on your trails will, if you just say, we're going to say a, set a date in the spring and the fall to, to have a trail maintenance day, and you have a potluck after it, You'll, you'll have more people than you know what to do with. So in conclusion, uh, there's been, a, 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 many of you probably aware of and, and perhaps have even participated in, big, big boom in outdoor recreation uh, as a result of this pandemic. I mean, people really want to get outside. Um, so the, the successful recreational trails can, can range from very simple paths through your uh, woodlot to very uh, more expensive, elaborate uh, venues like what you may have walked earlier today. And then finally, just to, to quote Stephen Covey, remember his seven habits or whatever, start with the end in mind. So know what it is, who you think that the trails are going to uh, service, what kind of activities you anticipate having on the trails, and you can't go wrong. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, John. Uh, we have time for a few questions, three, four questions, and uh, we'll begin right there, and then we'll go to Dave. Go ahead. Yes, sir. John, have you ever been involved in a backcountry ski zone development such as glade skiing? You know, I, I have made that suggestion to a number of clients because I've had a number of different places where it, it just seemed to me to be ideal. The train was great. 
Uh, the way that the, the cross country trail was configured would make great access both from the top and the, and the bottom of the glade. Um, I'm trying to think of any that, I, I was never involved in actually creating or building any, but I, I think it's, um, it's well worth considering if you have the terrain for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You bet. Yeah. I, I was just wondering if you could offer some ideas or suggestions on, on having a multi use trail where you're, you're skiing in the winter and you build it for that use. And then summertime comes along, you've got this beautiful corridor that may or may not be suitable for mountain bikes or, you know, some other activity. How that yeah, um, so the question was about your shared use, perhaps summer and winter, skiing maybe in the winter time, mountain biking in the summertime. One of the things that, that um, is a determining factor in terms of shared use, let's say within the same season, is the speed of the you know, participants. So in the winter time, for example, if, if you have a relatively narrow trail, Let's see, it's not the case here because they have nice wide trails. But if you had a fairly narrow trail and you were going to try to provide um, in the wintertime cross country skiing and snowshoeing on the same trail, you know, it can work, but, but it may not be ideal just simply because of the speed. And, and you throw another component in now, this fat tire biking craze is getting more popular. That's another. Um, a component of speed that's it's kind of a problem in the summertime if you have walkers and mountain bikers on the same trail again it's a, it's a little bit of an issue of, of these different speeds that are a problem oftentimes mountain biking gets a bad rap because um, early on it became so popular so fast out west that they were really degrading their trails uh, since that time, the folks that are designing and building mountain bike trails have become very, very skillful and environmentally conscious. And I think in many cases, they're setting the standard for how trails should be built and maintained. Um, I think, uh, for example, if you wanted, if you're talking about a ski trail in the wintertime that you would, let's say your intention was to make it available for mountain biking in the summer, one way to make that more appealing to the mountain bikers is just don't mow it to its full width. And you might find that what you would want like a two foot um, mowed strip, and I would, would describe it as being the best line within the width of the ski trail. And you might have to, you might have to armor that somewhat. You might have to put some gravel in there to, if, if it's just, if you're just working with sort of forest soils, if you are gonna get a lot of traffic, mountain bike traffic. But it certainly can be done and, it, and it's done successfully in a number of places. Yes? Yeah, no, horseback riding is, um, it, the, uh, the great key to horseback riding, I learned in, in one of these big national conferences is that in terms of the parking area, you've got to have a big enough parking area so they can park their trailers and get the horses out and everything. And then if you have 100 meters of trail that is exclusively for the horses before they join the other trail, the horses, after they get out of their trailers, they almost always use that 100 meters to relieve themselves. And then they're on the other trail and nobody's, there are no complaints. Everybody's perfectly happy about it. They can, if in wet conditions or moist conditions, horses can can have a you know negative effect on the on the trail. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. You talked about not using ski uh, skitter trails uh, for your. Recreational trails just because they're there, but what about the other way around designing your 
your recreational trails so they can be used for uh, skitter trails to be able to access your forest product when you need to. Yeah, good question. So the question I don't know if everybody heard, but it has to do with you know, using the skitter trails um, for recreation and, and conversely using the recreational trails for you know, forest management. One of the challenges is that, that a good recreational trail is going to be far more con convoluted than a typical skitter trail or logging road. But there's nothing that says you can't cut the corners or just pick up sections of the recreational trail to, to get your logs out. Because that, you know, it'll grow back. It's just that um, you probably don't want to use your recreational trail you know, with its, in its serpentine nature to try to, to get um, logs out. Now, if, if what you're actually doing is just getting in there with your tractor or your pickup truck to get firewood or something like that, then it, it, there's no problem with that. But, uh, and and I, I want to make it clear, it's not that you can't use logging roads or skid roads for recreational trails. There are certain sections that are just great. And you, you kind of will get a sense for that. But you'll also recognize there are plenty of places where the skidder has no problem going down a steep incline or back up a steep incline. And that's not always uh, ideal in terms of you know, recreation. So you can you can use sections that um, seem to to feel right, but avoid the the sections that don't. Thanks. Yes, sir. Can you talk about the limitations of narrow trails with no machine level? Yeah, the, the the limitations of a narrow trail in terms of skiing or or any hiking only. Hiking only, yeah. So the, the one thing that uh, I guess I would say along that lines is that if you have a wider trail, like one that I've been talking about for skiing, it, it's suitable for everything else. You can hike on it and, and it's not like people are gonna say, oh, this is a lousy trail because it's 12 feet wide. They typically don't notice, it's not that big a deal. Um, the con converse, however, is not true. It, it may be that your objective, that's why I ended this up by saying, well, be clear about the objectives. You may not have no interest in skiing. That's fine. If the interest is a nice hiking trail to a, an overlook or a, a pond or any of the potential features, and all you have in mind is hiking, great. And you're not worried about how much snow gets to the ground. It's not an issue. There's no reason why you shouldn't build a, a hiking trail. Probably could be, it doesn't have to be any more than four feet wide, probably. Does that answer the question? Yes. Um, yeah. We have a town where um, there's some controversy about just building trails by snipping branches. Yeah. Versus machines. Yeah. Wider. Yeah. I, it, I know I, there, there is some concern about that. Um, my, my experience has been, and, and you folks have all seen this with logging jobs everywhere. There's a, there's a big a kind of a shock factor for a lot of people when they first see a logging job. A year or two later, when things have started to regenerate, everybody kind of relaxes and says, oh, well, and they'd see a whole new, you know, generation of trees coming up, and it's this beautiful carpet of um, green, healthy regeneration. All of a sudden, it's, it doesn't seem that bad. And in case, you know, I showed you a couple of slides there of trails that are wide enough to meet the international standards, 20 feet wide on the flats and the descents. They're all seeded with conservation mix, and they're, they're beautiful. People love them. They can walk side by side, talk to each other, and they love them. Okay. All right.
Thank you. And thanks for what you do. John and John and Michael chose to spend time with us this afternoon on a beautiful October day. I'd just like to say thank you once again to all of them. Give them a big round of applause, please. Thank you all. Thank you. It looks like um, we haven't had anything to eat in the last hour and a half, and there's um, looks like a lot of goodies being put out back there. We need to take a break and freshen up a little bit, and then I hope you all stay around uh, as we um, share our remembrances of Putt Lodgett. So, see you soon. Did you want to say something, Kathleen? I'm sorry, here's Kathleen. That's okay. Um, I just want to say that on your tables, there are magazines. Those are from the American Forest Foundation. Uh, there is an article in there about Putt Lodgett, which is why we have passed those out. And the little um, seedlings on your table were donated by one of our members from Windy Mountain Farm, uh, Becky Bluen, and we are happy to have you take those home and put them in the ground and nurture them into lovely trees. So, thank you. About four o'clock we're gonna start the reception and there will be lots more food out. So, I hope you still have appetites. Please just take a minute to get up and stretch, mix and mingle, and then we'll have a few more uh, festivities going on. I think everybody's had a chance to fill a plate at least once. There is lots of really yummy food there. Um, we've got some time to keep eating. One of my favorite things to do is to eat and to feed people, and I get to do both of those today. So, um, we are going to start uh, the, the last part of our program today, which is the tribute, remembrance and celebration of Putt Blodgett, who was our longtime president. 20 years he served for Mount Midlands Association as the president. During much of his tenure, I served as the executive director. Um, you know, we, we were not prepared to lose Putt, not that you can ever be prepared for that, but uh, that was March of 2020, and this is our first opportunity to come together and really celebrate all that he did for Vermont Woodlands Association, for woodland owners, uh, for, for just the forest industry in general. He was a tireless man. Uh, we have a couple of folks here today who are going to say a few words about Putt. Uh, some of his his sons are here. We've met Boo before at meetings, but Peter is here as well. And we're going to hear from them a few words about their father. Uh, we're going to hear from Jamie Fidel, and I've got a few uh, a few remembrances in this presentation too. So I'm just gonna show us some pictures. Um, I do wanna mention this reception has been supported by Vermont Woodlands Association, the Bailey Charitable Foundation, many of our VWA board members, past and present, and friends. And our sponsors today, F&W Forestry, Ganya Lumber, Landvest, Weyerhaeuser, and Yankee Farm Credit, and we are grateful for all of that support. So. Putt Blodgett, that was our last indoor annual meeting at Vermont Technical College. So. <clears throat> and some of these are just photos that have been sent to me. Um, this one I'm gonna try to figure out how to play. Uh, uh, Jamie? Uh -huh. Can I just do this? Can you turn it up?
Bradford and Newbury, Vermont, and he had spent much of his life working on the farm there and then working in the forest. By then, he had sold the farmland, which allowed him to focus on the forest resources that remained. And focus he did. He implemented numerous forest improvement activities that included timber harvests, TSI, weeding and cleanings, pruning, crop tree release, planting, road building, and water management activities. In the later years, he spent literally hundreds of hours pulling and chemically treating invasive plants within the 600 plus acres of forest land there. And the result of decades of commitment to this forest resulted in an exemplary forest property that warranted the Tree Farm Award, or Tree Farmer of the Year Award, not once, but twice. That dedication to task typifies the cut that I knew. He immersed himself in the projects, organizations, and causes that inspired him. And those were many. Forest landowners from both Vermont and New Hampshire knew of Hutt and his commitment to good forestry through his presence on numerous boards, committees, and legislative testimonies in both states. I was fortunate to have been Hutt's forester for over 25 years, and I firmly believe that Hutt spent as much time in the woods as did many foresters with official diplomas. And I can vividly remember hearing him state one clear regret. I wish I'd gone to forestry school so I could have been a real forester. Well, Hutt, if I could, I would award you an honorary forestry degree. You truly deserve it. I miss you, Hutt. Thank you. Paul was here earlier, but he unfortunately could not stay, so he very graciously recorded this for me on Zoom. Um, Dan Kilborn is also a member of our board who couldn't be here today, and he has done a recording Thank for you. us. I wanted to offer some thoughts and a remembrance to Putt. Um, I can't say that I knew him all that well. Uh, definitely a little better once I joined the BWA board. But for the 20 years that I've been involved in the Vermont forestry community, I can't really remember a time not knowing uh, He was always present, always adding thoughts to the conversation. I read an interview uh, that Putt did shortly before he died. And in it, he expressed his love of Mount Musala, a 4,800-foot mountain in the White Mountains, New Hampshire. He described it as always on his eastern horizon. It was within sight of the Bradford tree farm that he owned where he grew up. Um, I climbed that mountain the year after Puck died, and then again this past year with my family. He said that uh, he first climbed it at the age of 14, and at 45, he ran up it with the Dartmouth ski team in 45 minutes. And then he made perhaps his final climb at the age of 88. Uh, just having turned 45 myself, uh, I, I just think about the grit that that man had to run up 45 minutes. But that's the passion and dedication that Pup brought to all that he did, especially with the management stewardship. Uh, he was a champion of active management that would not only support our local economies, forest workers, and forest products industries, but would also provide all the essential ecosystem services that we depend on for our woods, like cleaning our air and our water, mitigating floods, providing wildlife habitat, biological richness, climate adaptation. And at a time, when uh, so many of us um, need a reprieve from our hectic lives, the connections to our world and culture are made stronger by our relationships to land. And I think public like that. Thank you, Dan. I have some photos that were sent. John, I think you sent these. John Neininger? Did you send these photos to me? Yeah. yeah. I've got a few photos here. John, I don't know if you want to say a few words about them. Yes, um, I, I feel very fortunate to have worked with Putt. Um, he, he first contacted me um, years ago 
because I was building handcrafted log homes and I needed um, just perfect tall timbers, white pine timbers. And, and the, I remember the first time walking um, with him in the forest, looking ahead at his amazing trees, as many of you saw. And, um, but I kind of frustrated him because um, the trees I needed had to be with a very specific diameter range, just a couple of inches. Either way, of say 18 inches, depending on the house we were building. And, and they had to be really straight and tall, and I'd, I'd, he'd show me some trees, and I'd look at them, and I'd go, well, this is, this is nice and straight, but it's just a little small putt. And then he'd, uh, he'd shake his head, and we'd go look at another tree, and I'd say, well, that one's got a little bend in it. It's just the right size, but it's just a little tiny bend up there. It's not going to work. And eventually, <laughs> after marching through the forest, of course, that just got him going more, right? <laughs> to the next tree and the next stand of pine. And, um, and, but over the years, it was, it was just a joy to walk with him in the forest and, and see what an amazing forest he had and how he had grown this incredible timber. And then finally, the um, Dartmouth College decided to rebuild the Moose Lock Convene Lodge which I got to do the log work on that project, and Putt, as you know, was so connected to the Moose Lock of Lodge that he um, uh, wanted to donate a bunch of logs. And so we walked through the forest, and, uh, and he'd show me trees that, uh, Putt, Putt, where was this tree when I was looking for timber? This is amazing. <laughs> He looked at me and said, oh, I know, I, keep, I hold my cards close. <laughs> and then he'd take us and he'd say, he would find these trees that had been knocked over by the hurricane of 38. And the branches had grown straight up and these things had survived and grown into these unusual forms. And he would like insist that I find a place in the lodge for this crooked tree. And then one day he took us across this mountain along this cliff to this special tree. And sure enough, um, out of the side of the mountain was this hemlock growing in a big curve. And then another one that had a, a branch coming across and reconnecting that was shaped just like a D for Dartmouth, of course. And that's in the, the gateway. And um, he, he was just so excited about it and knew every tree in his forest and where he wanted it to be. And it was just such a joy and a privilege to, to work with him over the years and get to know him so well. So. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. So, I'm just going to run through some pictures here. This is Putt with Sidney Craven. Sidney could not be here today. Uh, Sidney and Putt were quite... Uh, quite close. I guess it's going forward. Um, Sydney has provided, is, has provided the funding for the Bailey Charitable Foundation that is supporting much of this uh, program today. So we are very grateful to Sydney. And this just wants to do its own thing. And I should probably let it. Because um, there are photos in here that uh, come from lots of different places. Um, I am not sure where that is. Where is that? Is that the lodge? Oh, the Ravine Lodge. Okay, from the outside. Okay. This was a VWA meeting when we had a, a young gal who had won our uh, essay contest. And then, of course, Pat with his stacking firewood. Uh, if I can hold this here, um, this was sent to me by Elise Tillinghast from uh, the uh, Northern Woodlands Magazine, Center for Northern Woodlands Education. And I asked her to send me a few words about Putt. And she said, the best way I can describe Putt is that he was both a major disruption event and a keystone species. He had the energy of five people. Did the man ever sleep? He was a passionate advocate for forest stewardship and forest landowners. 
With Kathleen, his long-term colleague slash co-conspirator, he inspired Vermonters to pay more attention to forests and to cherish them. There are so many people, myself included, who he influenced, and I'll always be grateful for his good advice and encouragement. And that's my terrible typing there. At least didn't actually <laughs> send it to me saying great three full foot or whatever that is. <laughs> Oh well, <laughs> I should say grateful. Um, and yes, Pud and I certainly were colleagues and co-conspirators for a lot of years. There were lots of times we went toe to toe on things we didn't agree on. Nobody has had that experience, have they? <laughs> yes, uh, that's the man I know and loved. He certainly told you how he felt and what he thought. Um, and here he is with his uh, Ben Killam Bears, you know, those are some of my favorite pictures. Putt and Ben had a very long-term relationship as well. And those cubs are just nestled right in there, you know, couldn't be happier. This was a presentation I went to um, when Putt was given the award by the Farm Bureau. Uh, and what was the name of that award? You were there, Peter, weren't you? I probably met you then, and I didn't remember it. I apologize for that. So um, that was a Farm Bureau Award. And we just have so many remembrances, so many photos of Putt in the woods, a place he always loved to be, Moore Ravine Lodge. Oh, my. Yeah. And more bears. So, um, oh, and this was a Germany trip. I think Al Robertson could talk about that one. I think that was the last trip that American Forest Foundation did before. Uh, it's a before. Guest house in what was that? It's a guest house in Freiburg. In Freiburg. And what year was that, Al? 2018? 2016. 2016. Okay. Okay. So, um, Putt has a very special mention in the congressional record as well, something that Senator Leahy did for us. Um, so our, our dear uh, past president is remembered in the congressional record. I have that full record somewhere. This is just a piece of it. And so, you know, it would have been Putt standing here today, greeting all of you and running the show. Uh, I am very grateful to Alan Thompson, who stepped up to fill some very big shoes, and to the rest of the VWA board. It is one of the most hardworking boards you can imagine. They are wonderful folks to work for. It could not be easier uh, to serve an organization than to work with this board. And of course, as Paul mentioned, Putt was a uh, second time Tree Farmer of the Year in 2011. And this is a poem that was sent to me by um, Peter Paul Steltz, Paul Steltz, who also couldn't be here today. Long -term count. At uh, Challenge Camp, yeah. And he sent me a photo that I couldn't actually take out of my text and get here. It was a great photo. Your dad saw in a big log, you know, this muscular man uh, with all these kids just uh, in awe at what he was doing. And maybe you'll mention his camp, because you certainly know about that. More than I do. <laughs> So uh, this, this poem, Last Water, not since and seldom in lost years before our last hike up Gorge Brook have I drunk from a mountain stream, knelt by its side and dipped my hand into its cool and freezing flow for fear of contracting disease, as had happened to me on one incautiously defiant day, feeling alive, immersed in mountain air, Fern and fur, mud and stone, and me, striding steadily, thirsting for a cleansing taste 
such as I've known when young. I couldn't help but celebrate and drink in my exuberance, worry aside. Weeks later, I would learn the consequence of trying to relieve lost purity, relive lost purity, and therefore since then hadn't given in to joy, instead judiciously, judiciously carried water from taps, I could be certain of. That is, until we stopped for rest, just as the section of trail you built swung north, away from Gorge Brook's steep descent. Its current slowed along this flat where we paused too. I watched, surprised, as you bent down and drank. No doubt as you had ever confidently done during hours surveying, laboring, as much at home amid these woods as anywhere. Shrugging off my skepticism, I knelt as you had done and drank my fill, sustained. So, this was just my little brief presentation, and I'm going to turn the microphone over um, to uh, yeah. Boo Blodgett, and we're going to have a couple of speakers, and then I'll invite anyone who would like to come and take the mic and say a few words to do the same. Well, it's been a pleasure. My father enjoyed this, this group throughout his tenure. He appreciated you, and he talked about you all the time. It was his life. He was just in awe of what was trying to happen and trying to be part of that. What I'd like to speak about today about my father is back earlier in his life, he loved to wander, you know, I mean, just to head out in the woods to be alone. And his, he was content with himself. A lot of us struggle with that, you know, that we need friends and family. And a lot of times, Dad didn't need that. You know, he was happy with himself. He was content. So he would wander. And the more I worked with him, the more he wanted everybody to wander and to wonder, to go out, to look at things, to find a way, to go around here, back up, go there, but just to try and put forth an effort to make a difference, and I'll always remember Dad, just, we'd be walking around in the woods, and then all of a sudden we're on some logging trail, and then it's boom, we're headed this way. We're just gonna wander and see what's out there. And I think that's why Dad spent so much time doing all those evasive, invasive species, is because he wandered off the path and found all these things. And of course, he couldn't just go by. We had to we'd pull it up or we'd have to come back and remember it. And that's how we found that. I remember pulling that piece of hemlock off a of stone cliff for what John talked about that bee there, you know? He found it. And so now we had to get it out of there. And that wasn't the easiest place to get it out of there. And, but. It, the wandering brings great surprises and great comfort in life. And I think that's the message that by the past to me, and hopefully, you know, that when you wander, you will always wonder and learn about life and enjoy it. Thank you. <laughs>